This is Brett Rademacher with Harold Smith, and we're doing our weekly discussion with the articles on hethathasanear.com. And we're in a series right now, Spring Feasts of Israel. And uh, I'm going to let you pronounce this because uh, I'm, I'm going to get slaughtered on this title. <laughs> 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 you like you like that you like that handoff i'm gonna give that to you go ahead what's what's the title of the article it's titled uh matzot and rishit <laughs> <laughs> the feast of unleavened bread and the way uh rishit is spelled you all understand why i turned that over to harold if you don't say it right you're just gonna like send the thing in the toilet ha <laughs> ha Pun intended. Okay, so <laughs> so hopefully we had a good chuckle before. Now every uh, the, we we start a discussion. So every article, I always encourage everybody. The article is the meat. This video discussion is the the potatoes or the frosting to the cake. You have to dig into the articles because there's a lot of detail that we just can't cover in the discussion. Specifically, uh, links in the article that go to Bible verses, word definitions other articles that it may expound or relate to the topic in the article. And then oftentimes there's extracurricular material that's linked in that helps support the framework of Harold's explanation or um, teaching in the articles. And so uh, what we got here is feasts that we're talking about, feasts of Israel, which from the Christian perspective, those don't apply anymore. So let's, let's dig in here and uh, see what we have in the way of feasts and why they're relevant to us today. Harl. Well, the feasts are relevant. Um, if you go back and you, you read um, in Exodus and Leviticus, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, where it speaks of these feasts, in every place that it speaks of them, it speaks of them as uh, to be observed in all generations by the faithful of Yahweh. Okay, what now? Say this again. It, it says that they are to be observed in all generations. Okay, the, well, that, 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 what, what Bible, what verse is that? <laughs> that's in, that's in every, um, every verse that is um that mentions the feast it says all generations that means continuously it is it does and, and so so are you telling me because uh are you telling me so that all those feasts even though yeshua has come and gone the first time that those feasts are still relevant for participating in today well, you have to remember Yeshua's words in Matthew 5, 17, where he said, I did not come to abolish Torah. And it's within Torah that the feasts are located. He said, I came to fulfill them. So we have to look at the uh, Greek definition of the word <clears throat> palero that is translated as the English fulfilled. And it means to be complete, where you don't add anything else to it. Not once in that definition or in Yahweh, in uh, Yeshua's words, does it ever say they're to be abolished, e even though that's the way the English uh, translation um, has, has made it. They just figured that, you know, uh, fulfilling means to abolish, but it doesn't. Now, having said that, we need to take a step back and look at these feasts, all of the feasts. You know, where did they come from? How did, how did, how did they come to be? And you, we have to remember that when, um, when Yahweh delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt in Exodus 3, it says that there was a huge mixed multitude that came out with them. And by anybody's best guesstimate, there's about 100, 
hundred and a half to 300 million people out in the wet wilderness. Um, wait, 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 300 million or 3 million? A million and a half to 3 million people. Okay. Okay. All right. I think you said 300 million. Uh, so no, I, I, I've heard that number. And, uh, and uh, I, when I first, I, I've heard like up to 3 million or something like that. That, that was staggering. That's a, that's a huge amount of people. And um, they were, it says in um, Exodus 18 that Moses was sitting and the, all of these people were coming to him. He was from sunup to sundown. He was sitting and these people would be coming to him with all of their, their problems, um, their questions, um, and about, you know, just the, the stuff of life. And it says in, in uh, Exodus uh, 18 that Moses was answering them according to the statutes of Yahweh. Now, this was two chapters before those statutes were given. So how was he able to do that? It was because the same way Abraham, uh, it says in Genesis 26, 5, kept all of the uh, uh, ordinances, statutes, and commandments of Yahweh. And that was 430 years. No, so what you're, what you're saying is these were, these were divinely revealed. Well, they are in the 10 words. Okay. We have a, the, the core nature of Yahweh is selflessness. And you'll see that thread running through all the 10 words. I, I think that's one of the most profound things I've gotten out of your teachings is just that word, that one word. I mean, it, it's, it, and, and I, I think it's a, a good thing to uh, reiterate because it, 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 it encapsulates a lifestyle mindset, right? It's, it's a very, um, uh, rearranging word <laughs> well it, 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 it's reiterated all through the messianic writings mostly as considering the things of my brother as being of more important than my own it's not self-denial it's, it's selflessness in where where we're giving of ourselves to our to our brethren but and but, but, like, but 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 i i think it, and you say this so you're not i'm not saying anything you don't already say but it, it goes beyond that it's really Selflessness is getting to the point where you're you're giving your life fully and willingly to the will of Yahweh. Amen. That's, that's right. That's that that is the crux of the the whole deal, right? Yeah, it's not self denial, but selflessness. And the way Abraham and Moses came to to be able to keep his his commandments and his ordinances and the statutes is because they understood his nature. They right. knew him. They spent a lot of time with him. Moses spent 40 years in that wilderness. Uh, Abraham spent a, 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 an applicable amount of time uh, himself getting to know Yahweh. And so when Moses is sitting there and he's, and he's answering these questions according to the statutes of Yahweh. He's speaking out of what he knew. Now, this mixed multitude that was that was integrated in with the Hebrew people didn't know squat about Yahweh. The Hebrews had grown up with him, so they they at least had a comprehension of who he was out there. But as far as this mixed multitude, when they came out of Egypt, there wasn't any criteria about who came. They just all came. And so you've got this, this huge mixed multitude of people I, who believe in all kinds of different gods. I, I, don't, I don't think a lot of people consider that in, in, in the influence or the impact that would have. Uh, it's, it's one of the reasons that while Moses was up on the mountain with, with the father for 40 days, um, they were, it was the mixed multitude that was clamoring for this golden idol so that they could worship because they, they felt abandoned out there. Anyway, uh, getting back to Moses, he's, he's doing all of this and <clears throat> we're, we're, we're talking about where did the feast come from? 
So Moses is doing all this, and in comes his father-in-law into this situation, Jethro. Now, we don't know a lot about Jethro. There's not, about, not a lot given in Scripture about Jethro. It says at the beginning of Exodus 18 that he was the high priest of the Midianites. We don't know a lot about the Midianites. We don't know what God they worship. They, we don't know um, how all of that um, uh, played out, except that because uh, Moses was Jethro's son-in-law, they had this relationship. And Jethro came by and he saw what Moses was doing and he said, man, you keep this up, you're going to kill yourself. <laughs> you know, you need, you need to delegate authority. So, um, so basically, he was, you, what, you're, what you're saying is he was getting an opinion that may or may not have been The, the point is, is that it didn't come from Yahweh. This idea came from Jethro. And if you go back into Numbers where, yeah, where Moses brought this idea to Yahweh, you'll see that he didn't inquire of, of Yahweh if this was okay, you know, if this fit into his deal. It was a demand. He came before Yahweh and he said, I can't do this any longer. Either take this from me or kill me. <laughs> and Yahweh, in his nature of selflessness, said, okay, go point to 70. And now, 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 this is, let's stop here a second. <laughs> you know, I, I think a lot of times we, we don't stop and look at something that happened and see how that relates to our life. So let's, let's talk about what maybe uh, would have been a better response. So let's say in our own lives, we've got a situation that we feel is overwhelming. We can't handle it. And so we're coming and saying, hey, do this or don't do this or do this and do that or just like Moses we're, we're kind of like saying hey I can't do it or I don't want to do it you know give me another option kind of thing what 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 how would that have been better played out do you think would have it would have been um better played out if Moses had come and and entreated Yahweh to find out uh, if if there might be another way to do this, that would be to relieve the burden off of him. But so so the issue wasn't the burden. The issue wasn't because Yahweh was very aware of what was going on. The issue was Moses' response on dictating how it should be solved, which I think is a common thing, right? We think we have the answer, and so that's the solution we want for the problem, and that's not necessarily the way to do it. Well, that's the way you're describing it is that is that spirit of self-determination where we try to take control of the situation rather than leave it in the hands of Yahweh. Well, I think, um, well, but, but what I, because I, I, so I'm a business guy, you know this, I'm out in the marketplace, you know, my job is to make business happen, right? So, so you've got this natural uh, uh, dynamic in business and this, self-determination right make things happen you're always having to make decisions to determine an outcome but i think everybody in life has has situations where they've already decided the outcome they want and, and the thing that has really been challenging my thinking uh <laughs> oh, you know over the last few years especially is uh in, in becoming more and more aware of it is i don't I can't necessarily even trust my own thinking of defining what the situation is, let alone coming up with the answer is, right? How many times, and being a driver type personality, how many times in, in people's lives where they've gotten ticked off about something because they didn't like the way it was, but down the road, you know, weeks, months, or years, it turned out to be a phenomenal thing because of it being a catalyst for something else, you know, maybe a, a change of direction, maybe different circumstances. So we don't really necessarily even know how to, so Moses is, is worn out, he's feeling overwhelmed, but that doesn't mean he necessarily has a proper assessment of the situation, let alone what the answer should be. I, I, I think that's right. In fact, if you go back and read carefully, uh, in the in the wording, 
Yahweh never said to Moses, bring the children of Israel out and whoever wants to come with them. It was not. Whoa, whoa. Was, See, was, how many people would even have that thought? How many people would even come back and go, wait a minute, you brought your own problem with you brought a problem with you. That's that's exactly what was what was happening there. And but but they were there. And Yahweh saw what Moses was going through. If he thought that he couldn't handle it, one, he would have stepped in and 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 done something uh, or said something. But but two, he was just kind of sitting back and saying, "Okay, Moses, <laughs> you you brought this thing with you. Now deal with it." But and, let me think, think about that from our perspective. How many problems have we brought on our own selves by making our own determination, our own assessment, our own evaluation, our, our own decisions, and then we're in the, we're in the midst of the, the quicksand, we're going like, help, right? Right. And so anyway, getting, getting back to Moses, and Jethro says this, and Moses goes and, and, and puts it before the Father, and he says, okay, form a committee. Of 70 people. <laughs> I mean, how much benefit have we ever seen come out of a committee? Um, and so th that's what happened. And understanding that in all of these people that are out there, they don't, because they don't understand the nature of Yahweh, they don't have a grasp on who this God is. These 70 are having to, um, to adjust to the behavior that's going on among them. You don't make up rules against behavior unless that behavior is exist, exists in their midst. And so they were, they, were, they were putting things in order to help these people, first of all, we have to understand that initially when they came out, the glory of Yahweh sat in their midst. And you're talking about this most brilliant of light, this consuming fire that even if a little bit of darkness comes into the, into the camp, you know, that's why all of that pestilence and, and uh, stuff, uh, uh, sickness and, and disease and, and uh, you know earthquakes, all this dramatic stuff happened while Yahweh was sitting in their in their midst, and they would they would bring little bits of darkness in there, and it didn't take a whole lot for all of this uh, calamity to begin to occur. And so the seventy were setting up these regulations and instructions for people so that they all wouldn't be consumed and. Um, so we have to, we, we just kind of have to step back from this whole scenario and understand that these, the, the, what they call the 613 ordinances of Judaism, <clears throat> they came out of this commission of the 70, this committee. Uh, what gave them the um, is, this, is this an example of organized religion? <laughs> yeah. well, the, the, the reason that the, that the weight <laughs> of all of those 613 ordinances were given, you know, thus saith the Lord to them, was because if you look at them closely, they all still contain that thread of selflessness that, uh, that permeates the 10. These are just, these are expansions on the 10 on how to, when, you, when Moses was, was by himself and he was addressing these concerns of people, he was, he was addressing them out of the nature that he knew of Yahweh. So are um, they still valid even though they came out of this process? They are because they contain that, that, that thread of selflessness. But if so, you look so, at it, but if you look at them closely, every one of them is based on the premise of considering the things of my brother as being of more importance than my own. If my cow runs through his fence and gets it all tangled up, 
I'm to pay repar repar uh, reparations for that and, and to make it right. Okay, so um, let, me, let me clarify this because this is a great point you're bringing up. So <clears throat> we would say, I'm not saying it's accurate, but it's been said many times that the United States is a, based on Judeo-Christian Judeo principles, especially you know, found within our legal system, for example. So, so here are principles within our legal system that are based on the Torah or Messianic writings in some fashion. Would that be that's similar? A, that's a lie. What? What you just said is what a way? lie. There, our, our legal system in America is not based on anything biblical. It is based on economics. And well, it is, well I, I, I don't want to go off on that, but th there are laws. For example, for example, it used to be in the United States that um, kidnapping was a capital offense, right? And it, that's no longer the case. So there, there's laws that have been set up around a framework. I'm not saying the whole structure or whatever there, but but what I'm my point where I'm trying to get at is, you know, this thing about murder or or theft, you know, when there's restitution, those kinds of things. There's a carryover of those kind of concepts into our legal system to a degree. But my my point is is not which part is you know a lie or which part's not. My part is that concept of taking, here we have principles in the 10 words that are now being put into a, a legal or a operational structural management organizational framework for, for the country or the, 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 um, uh, the people. And it's not um, directly given by Yahweh, but it's based on this concept of selflessness and we, when we see that in, in, in there, is that what we're talking about? Is where it's not directly mandated by Yahweh, but it's, work, it's, it's a structure based on the principles within those 10 words, right? No, it's, no? It, it, no, it's not. Because the laws of any country, any country, are based on the culture of that country. Right. For instance, in Denmark, they have legalized abortion, euthanasia, drug usage. Um, there's two or three others that, you know, are reprehensible in our society, in our culture. Uh, if you go into the um, uh, Islamic culture, I mean, you know, they cut off. No, no, I, I know, I know they have different rules. But I, what I'm trying, what, what I'm trying to get at is there's there was a principle outline. In, in the, the selflessness concept within the 10 words, and then this framework of these ordinances, 613, right, ordinances? 613 ordinances were put in place because, like I said earlier, you don't have rules against behavior unless that behavior exists. And so the culture that they were in was an amalgam of all these different places, and they were putting these rules in these regulations in to um uh mitigate all of these wild things that were going on but it, but that but those those uh regulations were for that culture in that place at that time for that people now when yahweh says that they are to be observed in all generations what he's speaking of, what who he is speaking to, is not some country two thousand years off, you know, called America. He's he's speaking to the Hebrew people in that culture uh, who are faithful to follow his words. <clears throat> so you 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 come up to where Yeshua is. And what he says holds weight. I didn't come to abolish the Torah and these feasts, I, or, or these regulations, rather. I came to fulfill them. So we have to ask, how did he fulfill them? Well, he became our um, Kippur. He became our atonement. 
he, he became our Pesach, our redemption. He became our Sukkot. Uh, we are now the temple. We, you know, it, it, he dwells in us. We don't have to go out in the, in the backyard and build a tent because we live in him and he in us every day. He so, has, so, th this he is has great... become all of these feasts. Okay, this, this is a great point. So I've heard the concept that these feasts were, you know, uh, foreshadows, shadows or types, things to come. And, and so if, if, if he has become all those things, so what you're saying, even though that's happened, these are feasts that we should still be celebrating ourselves today. We should be honoring them in the, um, you know. Honoring is different than celebrating. So what does that mean? What's the differentiation? <laughs> when I was in Israel, where this first came to me was when I was in Israel and a friend of mine who was messianic. He, he believed in Yeshua as um, Hamashiach. Uh, he was he was also Hebrew. And we had lunch one day, and, and he showed up. I, I'd had several uh, occasions of visiting with him before, but on this day, he showed up with a tallit and the zitzio, the strings hanging off of that. And I looked at him and thought, you know, what is this guy doing? And um, I asked him about it, and that's where he showed me in the scriptures where all of these uh, regulations had the, the phrase to be to be honored, you know, to to be honored in 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 all all you shall do them, fulfill them in all generations, and and that really puzzled me because I didn't know I didn't have an answer for that, and so I just I went to the father and I said I said what about this? Do I need to start? Uh, obeying all of these um, these laws that are that are given in there, uh, and the Zitziot is, is is in the six hundred and thirteen, uh, and I heard nothing. <laughs> he didn't say a thing to me, so oh, I just kept pursuing this 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 line, and and I even went to the marketplace and I I priced. A couple of tallits. Um, my friend said, "You know, if you're going to wear, if you're going to wear them, you need to get two because you need to have one on while the other's being washed." Uh, and uh, you know, I, for a week or so, and I and then I came back to the father and I said, "Okay, father, if you want me to do this, I'll do it." My heart had to be aligned with him. See, this is what Moses didn't do. With Yahweh at that at that occurrence, he just said, uh, "This is the way I want it." But I came to him in that same spirit of selflessness, and I said, "If this is what you want me to do, I'll do it. Say the word. I'm ready to do it. I got the money. I can go down and get the stuff." And that's when the father spoke to me, and he said, "Harold, what are the zitziot for?" I didn't know. So I went back and I looked and I found the passage where it says you're to wear these things and how you're to do them um, so that you remember to keep my words. And the father said, are you keeping my words? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, you don't need to wear them because you are fulfilling what the purpose of those are for. And he said, if you want to wear them, you know, have at it. It's not, it's not going to mean anything. Uh, but if you're already fulfilling the purpose of what they're for, it's not necessary. And that's when I began to look at all of these feasts in that same light. And the challenge to us today is to sit down individually, to sit down, not what somebody tells us, mm -hmm. but to sit down and to and to go through each one of these ordinances 613 ordinances and ask the father how these apply to me today and for some like my friend he told him he told him to wear them he had something that needed to be adjusted in 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 his life and that was the way the father picked uh for him you know for it to, to be done but it's not it's not a blanket thing and so 
we just have to, you know, back pedal. And, and, and so when we're looking at the feast, the feasts are, the, are contained in those 613 ordinances. Now, what I've discovered in researching those 613 for myself, I found that about a third of them cannot possibly be accomplished because they have to do with the Levitical priesthood, the sacrifices, and the stuff involving the temple and the altar. We don't have a temple and altar anymore. We don't have the Levitical priesthood anymore. So those things cannot be fulfilled. However, there's not one messianic that I've ever spoken to that doesn't get the concept that those that, that third of the 613 has been elevated to a higher place where we are now the temple. We, all of those sacrifices and all of that stuff, we are the priests of the temple. They apply to us, but they're, but they're in, a, in, a different, in a different fashion. <clears throat> I've, nobody, no messianic has, has ever questioned that. So my question is, if a third of these, a good third of these cannot be um, fulfilled, cannot be done, why are we trying to observe the other two thirds as though they, they can be, you know? And what we come away with is a bunch of rules and regulations that we try to apply not only to ourselves, but anybody else that's not doing it. And that is not what the spirit of Yahweh is about. Um, so in looking at these feasts, it's important that we look at them to see what's, what's, how, they're, uh, how they're expressed and how we can express them in our lives today. <clears throat> you got that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I, I think that's a good basis for them going into this, uh, these feasts. How do we keep them in our generation? Well, we've got, we've got a couple specifically that we're talking about. We're talking about the, 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 the Orthodox, rabbinical Orthodox traditional uh, religion of Judaism has taken the Feast of Pesach and the Feast of Matzot, the unleavened bread, and have because they 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 fall on the heels one falls on the heels of the other you know they've just grouped them into all one deal and where you used to have a feast on one day and then a feast on eight day i mean on seven days they put them together and now they got the feast on eight days right uh, and they call it the feast of pesach but it's not it's really two feasts and within the feast of unleavened bread you had yet a third feast which is the Feast of Rishit, which is the um, uh, Feast of First Fruit. Um, and they all have a purpose. They all are saying things to us. And so we have to, we have to uh, look at them, um, each one individually, and, and see why that the, the Father has, has caused them to to um, be um, uh, active for our generation. Uh, the Feast of a Matzot of Unleaded Bread took place because when that, after the Feast of Pesach, where the lamb was kept for four days and then slaughtered, um, as they left Egypt, they took unleavened bread with them because it had no yeast in it. It, they, it didn't have time to rise. They had to take what they had, gather it up, and leave right then. Um, and we're told very explicitly in uh, Corinthians that... Um, 1 Corinthians 5 8, where the Hebrew, Hebrew apostle uh, Shaul uh, says, Let us celebrate this festival 
uh, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What he's doing there is he's taking that feast of unleavened bread and he's elevating it into spirit, into where Yahweh and Yeshua exist, to where we now exist. This is, the, this is where the kingdom of Yahweh is. And so he's making, he's making a very definitive um, statement there and showing us that um, uh, leaven everywhere in scripture that in the, in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, where you read of leaven, this is considered, even among the, the traditional re, uh, rabbis, it's considered sin. So you have the leaven of malice and evil, of course, that's sin. And so the Father uh, <clears throat> is saying to us today not to practice those things, but to keep his feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. It becomes elevated. It's not a ritual that, that we have to abide by. It is a manner of behavior that if we behave according to the, to the principles of the nature of Yahweh, we will be uh, observing this feast and fulfilling this feast. So, so, so let, 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 me, let me paraphrase that back in a way. So what you're saying is operating in spirit is a reflection of what these feasts are supposed to represent and that it should be a lifestyle and that, that feast time is a reminder of, of operating in that spirit at all times. Exactly. The bottom, the bottom line for all of us is, is we have to look at where we are in this walk in relation to what the feasts are trying to convey to this selflessness um, component of our lives. You know, there's some feasts that, that mimic uh, the Shabbat, and they say, don't do any work today. You know, uh, when those feasts come up, I, I observe them. I don't, I don't go out and, and, and do any uh, commercial activity on those days. Um, there are other things about feasts that just, they just can't be, they just can't be completed, uh, in our culture today. You know, there's some things in the 613 ordinances. And the reason why I bring this up, because James says, if you break, you know, if you break one of these commandments, you're guilty of them all. Uh, and so to try to keep them all when a third of them can't be kept is, is really a, just a futile uh, approach to how these things uh, are supposed to be um, uh, handled. And uh, there's, there are um, regulations within the 613 that say if your son or daughter curses their mother or father, they're to be immediately stoned to death. Well, I don't think there's a child in, the, in our culture today that at one time or another hadn't cursed their mother and father. You know? Now, when you say curse, though, that could have a different meaning. You know, we might think curse as in swearing, whereas cursing here, does that not mean something else? When you, when you completely... Um, abandon the your your parents particularly in their older ages uh you're cursing them you're you are completely the the what they what they were doing that what the pharisees were doing they were saying uh there's a there's a stipulation in the um uh, in the tanakh that says it's a it's a 
it's in it's in the uh, 613 that that says if at birth a a uh, child is dedicated by his mother and father to be korban or to be set apart for Yahweh, then he's not, he, he belongs to Yahweh. He doesn't, he doesn't belong to them and they're not responsible for him and he's not responsible for them. And what the Pharisees were doing was they were taking that little caveat and they were applying it to themselves after they had been grown and saying, well, I'm Corban, and so I don't have to worry about, you know, honoring my mother and father. And this is what Yeshua challenged them on, saying, you know, you, 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 you um, apply these things to your life, uh, and it's by the tradition of men that nullifies the word of Yahweh. Um, and he, he was, he was saying that at the same time he was upholding that, that, uh, he was asking them about, you know, that if your if your child, if a child curses his mother or father, and he's saying, you're making a, a, a rule out of this that, that benefits you does nothing for anybody else. Uh, that's, again, the, it's, it's taking the selflessness of the words of Yahweh and turning them into selfish principles that apply to us so that we can feel, you know, sanctified and religious. I, I, I think the scripture twisting still goes on today, right? It still it's, goes it, on today. And it, it's, it's the nature, I mean, Basically, you know, I've heard people say you can you can get scripture to say whatever you want it to, right? Not not that it's really saying that, but you can get it to say what you want out of taking very specific verses and taking them out of context and creating a different meaning altogether. Perfect example would be the word of faith movement, where you can basically create your own reality by what you speak. You know, there is a truth in that. But yeah. what they have done is they've turned the selflessness part of that into the selfish part, and that's where they're, they're running with it. They're doing it for their own personal gain, not to, to benefit anybody but them. Yeah, I think there's a lot of – I think people have to be aware of uh, – I'm very aware of this, that you can take principles – you know, you might call them universal principles, universal laws. Those are terms people, you, you know, spiritual principles, spiritual laws. And, and they've been secularized to where people use them and get some kind of varying degree of results. And then they, but they, they've made them generic. So there's no accountability. That's where you step off in from the realm of Yahweh into sorcery. And even though it works, then that's the thing that people say is that, well, I do this and it works. Well, yeah, but you're, you're, you're walking in darkness when you do that. Kind of I, stuff. But, but see the challenge, the challenge I think is that they don't get the connection of what those really are tied into. Meaning there's a disconnect from both accountability it's like you have this power, but you don't really understand where it's from, and you don't have, know how to apply it, and you're completely disconnected from the source of it. You just have this generic law or principle or force, right? You know, everybody can go around and saying, well, you know, karma. You know, it's, it's a generic force that has, like Star Wars, right? You got the force, and it's, it's something you can control and harness. and and once you learn to do that, you can get a result. Same concept, right? Well, yeah. The difference is, is that it's that self-determination that separates us from the, from the true power, the power that uh, is in the light and life of Yahweh. And the, the, the wall we have today, you know, this brick wall we have today is you, you have people that, um, God is something of their own creation in their own mind, how they determine 
him or her or it to be. And so when you, you start getting into um, taking um, the reality of where this originated and applying accountability to ourselves, people don't want that. And that's, that's that concept of, you know, men choose to walk in darkness, meaning it's a conscious choice. How many people have you ever dealt with that say in one way or another, you know, I don't really want to know the truth or I don't want to follow that. Or a, a lot of times, you know, the argument that's coming from people or the denial or the rebuke or um, the outright hostility about, you know, God is the fact that people just want to do their own thing. So there's a rebellious nature and then they'll deflect everything you're saying with some kind of humanistic logic that if you really understand the core spirit behind what's being taught, you can see it's simply um, wanting to deny it for their own self benefit. And some of the things people say are just ludicrous, you know, in order to, to shore up their argument, but it really just boils down to, you know, the core concept of rebellion. You know, it, they just don't, I, I want to live my life. I want to do what I want to do, and I'm going to come up with any excuse I can to deny the existence of God. So I want to shift gears here a little bit, if we can. Yeah. Um, I have been approached by a number of folks um, this these past couple of weeks. We are in a, a jubilee year. Um, it began the first of Nisan, and of course Pesach. Is coming up this uh, this week, and because the Father has seen fit to bring Yeshua into existence and to honor each of these feasts with part of His life, uh, people have well, some of the faithful have gotten the idea that because we're in a jubilee year. And the Father does everything, this is what they're saying, the Father does everything according to his feast, that this Pesach and the coronavirus thing that we're seeing spread all over the earth is a result of the Father, um, you know, he's got his hands in all of this, and on Pesach we're going to see this something, I don't know, nobody can really put it into tangible words other than, something big's going to happen. And uh, I, I have a real problem with that because what they're trying to do is, is they're trying to for, make a formula out of something that Yahweh did in order to bring Yeshua into this realm for a specific purpose for a specific people. And what they're trying to do is to take that, um, to make a formula out of it and bring it forward um, 2,000 years and apply it to the, um, the culture that we have in existence today. And my response to that is, first of all, Yahweh doesn't create stuff in the in the world of men. That's that's not what he's interested in. The world of men, Homo sapiens, as far as he's concerned, are already dead. Um, this is one reason why Yeshua said, "Let the dead bury the dead," because um, they 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 are not involved in his spirit and in his kingdom so that, that in of itself is a profound concept we had we actually had an aha moment during one of our discussions and you ended up writing an article on it what was it called uh what is it becoming human what's that becoming human becoming human that was a really revelatory insight but because of that because of the way he looks at at the the world of men he's what we're seeing with the coronavirus 
and the HIV virus and all of these other things that have, that have plagued the world, <clears throat> they come as a result of men's activities. Um, here we are sitting uh, some decades from when the HIV, uh, HIV virus uh, spread across the globe. And I read, it, I read uh, uh, an investigative piece by this reporter that actually tracked down where the HIV virus came from. HIV is something that's common in monkeys. And there was a guy in Africa that decided he wanted to have sex with the monkey. And he, it was a Dutch guy. And he brought that, uh, got on a plane and he came back to the Western world he was homosexual, and because he was having uh, homosexual relations with others, that's where the that's where the HIV virus began. If you remember, in the beginning, um, that virus was confined to the homosexual community. Then, through you know people's um, behavior, it got spread out to where it became a, a fairly common thing. So whatever however this this coronavirus started there there is a uh, um a situation an environment that men have created that uh causes this thing whatever its um uh, source is yeah what, what, one of the things they're saying is it's you know coming from bats you know whether it's eating it, bats or whatever wherever it comes from there has been an environment created by men that facilitates the spread of this thing throughout the world. And Yahweh's not, he didn't have anything to do with this. This is just something that, that, you know, is a, is a, um, is a um, condition that is um, uh, brought about by the environment that men have created. Um, and as far as whether or not Yahweh is coming in all of this, I don't know. But I but I know I know that nobody knows. Even you should here, here, here's here's the thing I think people you know, as, we, as we're winding this up, as long as you're going, first of all, there's a lot of stuff in the article. Make sure you go back and read that. You know, we covered a lot of ground here. Um, it, you know, a lot of times these discussions springboard off a simple uh, concept or principle or idea in the article. And so we, we, we talk about that. And then there's other things that we don't even touch on in the discussion in the article. So, so be sure to read that. But this, this idea, every time there's some kind of cataclysmic event, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, earthquake, tsunami, uh, a disease, pandemic, um, war. As soon as it happens, you got all these people thinking it's the end of the world. That's been going on forever, right? I mean, well, it's that, been going on at least since it, since uh, the resurrection of Yeshua. No, 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 no. It's been going on forever. You know, uh, you know, a solar eclipse. You know, end of the world. Th this stuff has been going on for millennia, and we have to realize it's it's the natural nature of man to take a cataclysmic event, and it just seems like we've all been programmed that. You know, there's something like this that's going to lead to the end of the world. So as soon as something like this pops up, everybody's like freaking out, right? And then as soon as it passes, we're all back to normal, right? It, it, it's a very emotional roller coaster based, and a big part of it comes from what? What? Not listening. Not listening. Okay. Yeah. Not listening. And that, and and I think the biggest advice we can give everybody is if you're getting your reference points for life from the news, from your friends, from, you know, media in general, social media, what happens is there, there's all these voices. And just like Moses, hey, we're going to wrap this up real nice. Just like Moses listening to all these people telling him what he should do, or Jethro telling, tell, telling him what he should do, and then making decisions based on that rather than listening to what the father says, 
you're going to go off and do crazy stuff. You know, you're going to stockpile, you're, you're going to barricade, you're going to, you're going to treat life differently. You're going to operate differently. And, and I think the biggest point you can take from all these issues that we have out in the world is if you're, if, if that's the basis for how you live your life, like for example, if you lived your life the way the stock market's running right now, you know, you know, one day it's up a thousand points, next day it's down six or whatever, three thousand, next day is up four thousand. Hey, you're listening to the wrong voices. So how then are we to the scripture says that we should be watching for the day of Yahweh? So how are we to know when that day and Yeshua's appearing is drawing near? Um according to the scripture in second thessalonians 2 1 through 4 it says that first uh that day will not come except that fir that first comes a falling away from the faith and the man of lawlessness is revealed so there's there's two things in in that in there the the these things are to occur you don't you don't fall away from something unless you have an understanding of what it is uh, that you're falling away from uh, so that can't be the world because they never knew the truth to begin with um, and the son of lawlessness in other words people decide not to um, live their life according to yahweh's torah um, uh, so when we, we look for the day of Yahweh through the lens of physical events, like you were saying, occurring in the, in the earth, it only serves to give us a very skewed aspect of Yahweh's plan and purpose. There is, however, an aspect that is given to us in scripture about what to be looking for from the perspective of the father. And it's found in Isaiah 52, six through eight. It says, therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that speaks. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bring good tidings, which publish peace, that bring good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, and that says unto Zion, your Elohim, or God, reigns, your watchman, shall lift up the voice with the voice together shall they sing for they shall see eye to eye when Yahweh shall bring again zion when the watchmen together sing the same song when the watchmen together see eye to eye then those that know his name and we spent a whole series of articles uh, talking about knowing his name when they hear, the, the, those that know his name will hear what he is speaking, and then shall the Father bring again the kingdom of Zion. Yeshua's appearing is not going to be soon. Yahweh's appearing is not going to be soon, because what we are hearing today is a cacophony of discordant voices, some, none of which publish peace, peace among the brethren. Most of the voices today are calling for vengeance and retribution that stems from a misunderstanding, a not knowing of the essence of the nature and character of the one true Elohim of Israel, who is full of compassion, mercy, and grace. He is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Amen. I think that's a good way to finish it up. Good job.